Hi, this is National Master Dan Heisman, and we're here with another video to help you improve your chess game. If you haven't told your friends, your chess friends, about my video channel, I ask as a favor that you might want to do that. Uh, that's the best way to get it known, so please pass the word. Today we're going to talk about maximizing long-term learning. And this is going to be a little bit more like a podcast, so I'll try to use the board a little bit, but if you're looking for a lot of action on the board, maybe one of the other videos will be better. Anyway, let's talk about maximizing long-term learning, and we're going to compare it with short-term results. A lot of people don't even think about those two issues. So, for instance, if I have a new student and he said, oh, I used to take lessons from another chess instructor years ago, and I said... Uh, what, did, what did they tell you to do? Sometimes they say things like, well, I'm not very good at tactics, so they told me to play openings that avoid tactics. Or they told me, I'm not very good at the end game, so maybe I should decide the game in the middle game. Or I'm not very good at this, so maybe... And what the other instructor is trying to do is they're trying to help the student maximize short-term results. And this makes a lot of sense if you're playing in the World Open. Let's say you're trying to... Uh, get a draw on the last round of the World Open to win $10,000. And let's say you open E4 and your opponent plays E6 and you play D4 and he plays D5. And you say, all right, I'm not very good at openings. I'm not very, I don't know a lot about the French. Um, I, if I get into a complex pawn structure, I probably would not know how to use my pawns. Let me just play that exchange variation and we'll get into a nice symmetric pawn structure and maybe we could trade off some pieces on the open E file and I'll get my draw and I'll win the $10,000. That's very smart thinking. That makes a lot of sense to think that way because you're trying to maximize your short-term results and you want to do things that minimize your weaknesses, don't expose your weaknesses, and try to maximize your strengths. And in the long run, of course, you want to maximize your strengths anyway. But if you're not a very good player and you have a lot of weaknesses and your goal is to become a pretty good player, then you have to work on those weaknesses. For instance, a lot of my students say they're not very good at visualizing positions. And when I talk to them about why, one of the reasons is they play a lot of 10 and 15 minute games where they don't have a lot of time on each move and they can't practice visualization. And then when they do play a slow game, instead of trying to move the pieces around in their head so they slowly get better at it, they kind of hand wave the position so that they're not actually analyzing. When you listen to them analyze out loud, they're saying things like, maybe I should kingside attack, maybe I should bring out my bishop, maybe uh, I could bring my rook to h3. They, they, they're not actually saying, if I play rook h3 and they play h6, what would be my next move? Maybe I could play bishop d3. They're not actually looking at sequences two and three moves deep. They're not even trying to do that. So they're not practicing visualization and it, there's no wonder that their visualization gets better. So what they're doing is they're kind of masking their weaknesses and they're not trying to get better at the things that they're not very good at. So again, in the long run, you want to do the things that you're good at. If you're you know, a good tactical player, it, it doesn't mean in the long run you don't want to play tactical positions. Of course you do. But if you're not very good at something, you're not very good at learning openings, then maybe you want to do things so it would force you to help learn openings so you would know more about openings. Because even if you play an opening that avoids opening theory, you're still going to play black or you're going to get into games where your opponent plays something strange. And you're going to have to know something about what you want to do in the opening. And the more you know about general opening principles or how to play various types of openings, the better off you are, even if you're not very good at studying openings. So let's get back to maximizing long-term results. Well, if, if you're playing a French and you're not playing in the World Open, then this kind of pawn structure where it's very symmetric and it's very clear you're going to put your rooks on the e-file and the rooks are going to get traded off, that does, is not so conducive to learning because it's a fairly easy position to play and there's not a lot of strategy on what you want to do. On the other hand, if you play one of the other lines, let's say you play the main line in the French, which is to play knight to c3. All right, well, now black has several things he can do. The three main lines being knight f6, putting more pressure on the e-pawn, 
D takes E4, which is the rarest of the three, which is the Rubenstein, and bishop to B4, which is the winnower. And these lead to more unbalanced positions. For instance, if we look at one of the main lines in the winnower where white plays E5 to save his pawn, black plays C5, white plays A A3, black takes the knight, white takes back, and black usually plays like knight to E7. Well, in this kind of position, we have a semi-fixed center, but we have a lot of imbalance. White has doubled C pawns and an isolated A pawn. White has a semi-open B file. Black has played his break move on C5 and has to decide when he wants to play his break move on F6. White has to decide where he wants to put his pieces. This is, um, this is an unbalanced position where um, you've got things that both sides can learn about doing. My point is you're going to learn a lot more from playing an unbalanced position like this than you would learn by playing a kind of symmetric, more boring position like the exchange variation. I often see people say they're playing certain openings because they're not very good at tactics and they're trying to avoid tactics. So for instance, they'll play something like the King's Indian attack. Now with the King's Indian attack, it doesn't matter that much what black's doing. I mean, it matters obviously, but in terms of what opening you're playing, it doesn't matter as much. So white sort of says, all right, no matter what you do, I'm gonna play these five moves. And the idea here is to prevent the, the pieces from getting into touch with each other so that it puts off your tactics. All right, well, that's true. You're much less likely to get checkmated in five or six moves if you're playing the King's Indian attack than if you play an opening, you know, a King's Gambit or something where the pieces are starting to fight right away. The problem is twofold. One is you're maximizing your short-term results, but in the long run, if you're not very good at bad tactics, the best thing you can do is study tactics, play tactics, get exposed to tactics, and work on them and work on them and work on them until you get better and better and better at them. Will you ever get as good as Gary Kasparov? No, that's probably uh, almost unlikely to the extreme, but you will get better at them, and if you avoid them, then it doesn't work. The other problem is when they do stuff like this, the game's going to get tactical anyway. It may, instead of getting tactical on move 8, it may get tactical on move 16. But how good you are at tactics will still have a very, very high effect on how the game is. Putting it off for a few moves doesn't help you that much. Now, the other reason people play openings like this is they don't want to study openings. And that makes a little more sense. If, you're, if you don't have a lot of time or you hate studying openings, then okay, if you want to play an opening where there's not a lot of traps and where you can just play a bunch of little, you know, rote moves and get your pieces out, okay, that that's okay. But in the long run, that's not the best way to become a good player. The best way to become a good player is to play lots of different types of openings, openings where you can do that, openings where you can't do that, openings where you have to fight, openings where there's position. Just play different, and you don't have to change your opening every move, every, sorry, every game. You want to change your opening slowly over time. Like maybe for white, if you want to play the King's Indian attack for white, and you say, well, also to, to minimize my learning, I'll play the King's Indian for black if, if white plays d4, c4. So for instance, if we, if we go to d4, c4 and play the King's Indian, we could play those same five moves for black that we just did for white. We have to play d6 first. Don't have to, but we should play d6 first. Bishop b2, castle, main line of the king's Indian. It's the same kind of thing we were lo just looking at, except upside down. So we've got it playing for black instead of white. Does that minimize your learning a little bit? A little bit. You still uh, realize that black playing the king's Indian is not the same as white playing the king's Indian attack, but at least some of the themes and ideas are similar. Um, but then when white plays, if white plays e4 instead, you could play a Pierce defense and say, well, that's also similar. But it might make sense here if you're trying to maximize long-term learning to do something that's just the opposite. Maybe even play a Sicilian. You know, if you play a Sicilian, let's say you play d6. And they play the open Sicilian, which less people are playing these days for the same reasons we're just talking about. It's easier to learn to play an anti-Sicilian. Well, this is not at all like a King's Indian attack. This is going to be a fighting defense. And maybe you're going to learn a little bit more about your tactics and so on when you're doing this. So what you want to keep in mind is 
you want to match your goals with what you're doing in the short term because the goals are long term and what you're doing in the short term if those two things conflict too strongly then you're not going to get what you want so I, I, I often re get new students and they say things like, you know, I'm 1,200, I'm 37 years old, and my goal is to become an expert. And then I say to them, all right, well, to become an expert, you got to play a lot of US, I, the USCF doesn't give out an expert rating for anything except slow tournaments. So you got to play a million slow tournaments in order to become an expert. And I say, are you playing in tournaments? And they say, well, not right now because of the pandemic. I'm only playing online. And I say, okay. And what kind of speed are you playing? They say, well, I mostly play, you know, 10 minute games on chess.com or Elite Chess or ICC or something. And I say, okay, but you know, your skill in 10 minute games is related to your skill in slow games, but it's not the same thing because you have to learn how to think about your moves. And if you're trying to maximize your long-term learning and you're trying to become an expert, expert is something you get for playing slow games. So you wanna play slow games. And eventually, expert is something you get for playing over the board chess. Maybe someday they'll give out online titles as well. But for, for the moment, if you want to say you're an official USCF expert, you have to play over the board chess and you have to play over the board slow chess. So that's what you want to, you want to do so that you can press, start getting into that area. And if you're already 37 years old, it's a lot harder to get better. You don't have as much time. You've got a job. You've got a family. Um, you know, you can't go on a chess tour. So you really need to, to get working on the, right, on the things as, as soon as you can. If you keep putting them off, then you could go to a good instructor and no matter how good they are, they're not going to make you an expert just by making a couple of paradigms where you have an epiphany and say, oh my, oh, Dan taught me not to play hope chess. So I was playing 1200 and all of a sudden now I'm playing 1900. doesn't really work that way. You know, you get better, could by taking two steps forward and one step back. Now, is it possible you could have a really good streak and really learn something and gain a couple hundred points and really keep it? Yes, but more likely people gain points than they lose a little, they gain more, they lose, and they slowly get better. But it takes time, it takes effort, it takes work. And those things you have to put in as soon as you can because it, the more you put them off, the, the more you don't learn. So when I hear people say, Oh, my coach used to tell me that, you know, I'm going to do a lot better playing the Caro Can because he can teach me that and he can teach me 10 moves in the Caro Can. And once I play those 10 moves, then I'm perfectly okay and I'm getting into the kind of position that I really like and that maximizes my short term results. They don't use the word short term results, of course. They just say that gets me the best I can. And I say, yes, if you're just playing one game and you need the results in that one game, that's true. But if you want to get better in the long run, you want to do things that help you work on your weaknesses so that they're not as much weaknesses as they were before. Yes, it's true. If you do that for a few years and you're still terrible at things, you know, you, you, you work on your weaknesses and you work on your work on the work on them, then you expose them and you still have some problems with them. And now you want to mask them a little bit. OK, well, that makes some sense. But. If you're not a very good player and you're just starting out or you've just been playing a couple years and your ratings, you know, 1200 or 1300 or whatever it is, and you really want to be a much better player, that's not going to work. You really have to work on your strengths and w try to work on your weaknesses. Think of it as the famous, the chain is only as strong as your weakest link. We could say a chess player is only as good as the worst things that he does in terms of how exposed they are and how much the other person can take advantage of that. And you, there's no way you, in, in the long run, if you want to be a good player, that you can avoid things like tactics and visualization and things like that that you might not be very good at right now. Again, it has to do with your goals. If your goal is to be a good player, then you have to be able to do things like that and you have to work on them even if you're not very good at them right now and you don't really want to mask them. Also, the chain is as only as strong as your weakest link applies to your moves of the game as well as your strength overall. So for instance, if you play 1800 strength on 35 out of your 40 moves of the game, and on the other five moves you play 1200 strength on three of them, and then you play like 400 strength on two of them, we can't just take all those numbers and add them up and divide by 40 and get your strength. If we did, you'd come out around, you know, 1650 or something. But that's not the way it works. 
if you play 1800 on 35 moves and you play like a 1200 on three moves and then you play like a 400 on two moves those two moves where you play like a 400 and you allow your opponent to play an easy tactic those are the moves that are going to really decide your rating you're going to be much closer to like you know 1100 when you do that that's the problem is people fool themselves and when they play like an 1800 for 35 moves and they say oh mr heisman you know I, I, my rating's only 1,100, but I play 1,600 players all the time, and I'm, the engine always says that, you know, I get to move 26 against most of them, and the engine says I'm at, at 0 0.07, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing just as well as they are, but then, you know, I lose my concentration, or I, I get into time trouble, or maybe I play a move too fast, and then all of a sudden I overlook something, and they, they get a tactic on move 37, and then I lose the game. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm almost there. I just need to get to, get to do that. Well, they're, they're right in the sense that they're almost there, but it means you have to be consistent on all the moves throughout the whole game, and you've got to minim minimize those weaknesses. And again, the way to minimize them is not to try to avoid them. The way to minimize them is to say, how did I make that weakness? Where did it come from? How can I work on it? And how can I get better in the future? So you want to take those things that you're doing wrong and you want to take them and try to get better. If you watched my previous video, uh, we were playing a 45-10 game with consultation. Now, with consultation, you're talking out loud. You really can't think the way you normally do in a game quietly and do a lot of quick thinking. So it's really almost like playing almost a faster game. But the people in my group suggested that we were up a piece for two pawns and we should trade the queens. And that sounded reasonable to me. And superficially, when I looked at the board, it looked like trading queens should be okay. If I had looked a lot deeper, I probably would have seen that trading queens was probably not the optimum way to do it. But, but I, I agreed that trading queens was probably the right, right idea, or at least a good idea. And we traded the queens. And when I went over the game afterwards, I was very surprised that the computer dropped the evaluation so much when we traded queens. I thought it might drop it a little bit. But when it dropped it that much, I, I learned something. So, you know, it's not that I didn't know that trading queens could be a really big critical decision. It's just that in that kind of position, it's very rare that trading queens would be such a bad move, uh, you know, when you're up in material like that. And I've always taught my students, you know, if you're up a lot, you always want to, you know, make fair trades of pieces and not necessarily pawns. But when you're up a little and up a piece for two pawns, it depends on the position. Early in the game, if there's nothing happening, up a piece for two pawns is a monstrous lead. That's a gigantic uh, advantage. But when you're up a piece for two pawns in the late middle game and your opponent has a pass pawn and potential pass pawns and you don't have all your pieces in the game and you still have to get your pieces where they're going to be optimum, then it's very possible those two pawns are going to cause some problems and you can't just trade the pieces like that. So, you know, there I had a potential weakness that I thought that when we had the small lead the trading queens would be okay and I didn't check it as deeply as I probably should have and that tells me in the future that if I have a small lead and I can trade queens even though it's normally let's say 85 or 90 percent of the time a good idea in those 10 or 15 percent where it's not a good idea you have to be very careful about that now I'm very very aware that this was already the case but this was a particular case where I was exposed that that I wasn't able to tell all the people in my group because I was the strongest player, hey, maybe trading queens here is not a really good idea. And I didn't say that, and I probably should have, and I didn't realize it to the extent that I needed to. Is that going to make me a much better player in the future? No, of course not. At my level, uh, age is probably deteriorating me faster than anything that I can learn. But that's okay. You want to you want to minimize your weaknesses but you don't want to mask them in the sense that you can't work on them and you want to get things out so that you can play better so let's go over this main idea again because i see this idea all the time and that idea is how do you get the best you can in something you're about to do like the game you're going to play or you're going to play at the world open and try to win ten thousand dollars that's when you want to maximize your short-term results if Going to the World Open means, let's talk about our, our famous London system here, which used to be uh, an opening that nobody played, that it didn't even have a name. When I was a beginner and we studied this, 
you know, back in the days, we would just call this a queen's pawn opening because, you know, it's not a queen's gambit with c4, so we just call it a queen's pawn game. You know, but it became so popular, it's, it, it got a name. It probably already had the name London System. It just wasn't a well-known name. So Bishop F4, London System. Well, a lot of people play the London System, and they, they don't want to study a lot of openings. They don't want to get into openings that have a lot of tricks. They just want to get their pieces out. And if you're playing in the World Open, and you're rated 1,100, and you're trying to win the under 1,200 section, and you don't know a lot about openings, and the World Opening is going to start next week, and you're... you're Coach says, play the London system so that you can just get good games with white and then you're, you can take your tactical ability and, you know, just try to, you know, play out, play people in the middle game, but you don't have to study your openings very much. Well, that makes a lot of sense to do that because in the short run, playing the London system will help you avoid opening, avoid opening traps, avoid a lot of opening theory. You know, you need to learn a few things. Like, for instance, I tell people... In the London system, when, you know, Black starts getting ready to take away all these squares from the bishop and he's going to trap the bishop here, at some point around this point in the game, it makes sense to play h3, not because you're worried about knight to g4, not because you're worried about the pin there. It's because if he plays knight to h5, you can not lose the bishop pair and you could preserve the bishop and play bishop there. So that's a, a small thing to learn. Another thing I teach people is, you know, if you're on the black side of the London system, you know, avoid the one trap, which is to play um, your knight. If white plays his knight to e5, let's, uh, let's do that little trap here. Knight here, pawn here, pawn here, bishop here. Bishop e2, castle, knight e5. Um, let's play c5, c3, castle, sorry, uh, knight bd7. This is the one trap that black needs to know because his bishop is not guarded. Can it be attacked? Well, no, knight takes d7, queen takes d7. Uh, guards the bishop, and knight c6, pawn takes, bishop takes, does win the bishop pair, but white can play knight takes f7 here, hitting the queen, and also hitting the bishop twice, and black has no choice but to capture here, and then when he, he loses the bishop, he, white not only gets the bishop pair, but he also wins a pawn. So that would be a trap to avoid, so knight bd7 is a really terrible move here. The engine says black's better if he plays a good move like knight to c6, or queen to c7. If you want to see more on stuff like this, I have a video called Playing Black Against the London System. That's not the purpose of this video. This video is to talk about short-term learning and short-term results versus long-term learning. So when you're doing this for white, when you're doing this to avoid things, you are making sense in the short run, but you got to re-examine what you want to do in the long run. If in the long run you want to be a much better player and not just to maximize your results in the short run, you want to do things that will make your chain not as make your chain as strong as your weakest link and make your weakest links much stronger. Or if your game is only as good as your worst move, you want to find out what's causing things to make your worst moves and not try to mask them or try to avoid them. I mean, avoiding them works in the short run a little bit. But what really works in the long run is finding out why you made that mistake. Try to do things in the future that work, that strengthen that area, that avoid that kind of thought process error, whatever it is that's causing those mistakes, and try to expose yourself to them so that you could say, all right, this is what's happening. This is what I need to fix this. I can do this so I don't make these mistakes. Those are the things that are going to make you better players in the long run, improving your visualization rather than avoiding having to visualize playing those longer games where you have to visualize rather than playing the short games where the visualization isn't necessary. If your goal in the long run is to always play 10 minute games online and you never want to play anything else and you never want to have to visualize and you don't want to be a strong play player that way, well then okay, if you say, but Dan, I want to be a strong 10 minute player. Who are the best strong 10 minute players in the world? The best strong 10 minute players in the world are the best players in the world. How did they get to be so good? 
They played a million slow tournaments, and then when they get to play 10-minute games, they can have a lot of fun and say, oh, I know what to do in this position, or I know how to think, or I know how to do these things, or I know how to recognize these patterns. By playing a million sh slow games, they became really good fast game players. It doesn't mean they didn't practice playing fast games too, but, you know, the the Magnus Carlsons and of the world play in a million tournaments. The Fabio and Carrianos and the Hakara Nakamura's, when they were kids, I used to see them here in Philadelphia playing in the World Open or the National Chess Congress. So they went around the country playing in all these slow tournaments, and that's what they did. And it really helped them become really good at those faster games. But if you're only going to play those faster games, okay, it, you know, it's all right to do that. Nothing wrong with it. But you're not going to become an expert that way. And the, some of the skills that help you become a good 10-minute player are the skills that you actually get from playing slow games as well. All right, I think I've gone on long enough. You've got the idea. If you like the video, you can like it. If you haven't told people about the website, about the uh, channel, you can. If you haven't subscribed, you can do that. We will see you next time. Hope this helped. See you then. Bye.